you take our Bibles, please, and turn to Philippians, the book of Philippians, chapter number three. And we are continuing a little three-part series in this chapter three of the book of Philippians. Philippians is one of the prison epistles. The apostle Paul wrote this from a Roman jail. And interestingly, the whole book is about being joyful and having joy. And you think to yourself, how in the world could you have joy writing from a Roman dungeon? Well, you see, our joy is not dependent upon our circumstances or the things that we have. In fact, what he says is to live is, the, is Christ, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And you know, when you have Jesus, you'll never be disappointed. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Uh, you will not lose him. You will not lose what he has given to you. And when we think on, the, on those things, then we can have true peace and true joy. Well, we're going to start our reading this morning in Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 10. And we will read through verse number 19. If you're able, would you please stand with me for the reading of God's word this morning? <clears throat> and do pray for my voice, if you would. Verse number 10. Paul says, that I may know him, that I may know him. And the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend, that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded. And if anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be ye followers together of me. And mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and I tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Our Father, we thank you for your precious word this morning. Give us grace and help today to understand it. And we pray, Lord, that every believer will be challenged to press on uh, to fulfill the purposes of God for our lives. Help us to realize there is such a thing. And help us, Lord, to desire in our hearts to know you and to follow you, Lord, and to accomplish your purpose for our existence. So, Lord, give us grace today. And if there's anybody without Christ, help them to understand that it is not through religion, but it is through a relationship with Jesus. And, Lord, may we all be grateful for that this morning. For we ask it in Jesus' precious name, for his sake. Amen. And amen. Please be seated, uh, if you would. <clears throat> In this book of Philippians, Paul is telling his story, and he's actually encouraging other people because he has said in chapter 1, the things that have uh, happened to me have fallen out rather than to the furtherance of the gospel. In other words, when you're in the will of God and in the plan of God, the Bible says, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Now, the Bible does not say all things are good. There are many things that are not good in this life. But because we're in the, in, the, in the grip of God, we're in the hand of God, he is able to work those things and orchestrate those things and craft all of those things for our good and for his glory. How does he do that? We have no idea. That's something that only God can do in his sovereignty. But the Apostle Paul, humanly speaking, was in dire situation. And yet he's wanting to tell us, even today, his story. We called it last time his testimony. And of course, it starts in chapter 3, verse 1. And he tells us his background, how that Paul was a really the, the poster boy for religion. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was a Pharisee. Touching the law, he was blameless. But he said, the things that were gained to me, my religion was my life, he said. Now his tune has changed, his story now is that Christ was his life. But there was a time when it was his religion was his life. And yet his religion did not satisfy, and it did not save, and it did not work. And so he concluded, but what things were gained to me, and my religion and my life, those 
I count it loss for Christ. And last time we talked about Paul winning Christ. And that's something that all of us, all of us, if we are to see heaven, if we are to enter heaven's, heaven's door, we must win Christ. We must have Christ as our Savior. Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be seen. And we said last time that down in verse 9, Paul says, he counted loss all of his religion. He lost his religion that, I may, that he may win Christ. Uh, some people are, being, are, are stopped from getting saved because of their religion. And that even could be part of the Christian religion. Because not everything that calls itself Christian truly is. It is Christ that saves. And he is the door. And we may enter in. And he says in verse 9, And be found in him. Isn't it wonderful that one day, if you're saved, that when the Lord looks upon you, he doesn't come in judgment because you're found in him. It's like those in the days of the Exodus that are found behind the, the door with the blood on it. It's like Noah, he was found in the ark, and we are found in him. We're behind the door of Christ. He is the door, and we have entered into salvation and into the place of safety. And so Paul said, I won Christ to win him. To have him as my saviour. And verse 9 of course is so important. You might want to look at it. He says be found in him. Not having mine own righteousness which is of the law. But that which is through the faith of Christ. The righteousness which is of God by faith. Not self-righteousness. God's righteousness imparted to you. Given to you. God takes his glory, his goodness, his righteousness. And he clothes you in his righteousness. And when he looks at you that's what he sees. And that's how he treats you. And that's what salvation is. And so Paul starts the story out by telling us how he won Christ. To win Christ. Now in verse 10 he continues the story you see. You know it's important to understand that when you get saved that's not the end. That's really just the beginning. You know I got saved 45 years ago. And that's, that's, a, that's quite a long time ago. And you know the Lord didn't take me to heaven uh, right after I got saved, I was ready to go, and uh, I probably would have enjoyed that. But the Lord left me here, and he left you here, and he left the Apostle Paul. After the Damascus Road experience, uh, Paul's life was still ahead of him. And what we find here is that he, uh, after he got saved, began a process and a relationship of pursuing Christ. In verse 10, notice it says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Now I want us to, to see the order here. I think it's critical that we understand this because it reinforces really what salvation is. We're saying now in verse 10 that Paul is going to tell us about pursuing Christ. And you would think that um, we pursue, we pursue, we're, we pursue and then we win. But it's actually the opposite. Christ wins, Christ, uh, Paul wins Christ first and then he pursues him. And it's kind of like this. Is my microphone on, brother? Is it on? Because it wasn't on last week and that was a problem for the broadcast. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, listen, I got engaged 42 years ago. Yeah. And uh, I'm very excited. It's muted. Okay. That's, so, uh, okay. My fault. Thank you. It wasn't muted last week, but anyway. <laughs> so 42 years ago, Les and I got engaged, Sunset Rock overlooking Chattanooga. What a beautiful scene. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever been there. We hiked. We went down there last year. And when we were 18 years old or whatever it was, 20, 21 or something, uh, we, man, we ran down there. We ran back. We, well, we walked down, and we couldn't hardly get back up again. <laughs> we had to stop about four times coming back up the hill again. These young people were running up and down. We were sitting. <laughs> anyway. But wouldn't it be a thing if I came to Leslie and said uh, at Sunset Rock, now Leslie, <clears throat> I want to marry you. And so for the next 50 years, I want you to live in my house. And you know, I want you to cook my food and wash my clothes. And I want you to love me as a wife would love me. And then if you really do it really well, then we'll get married. I, I, I kind of know what she would tell me. <laughs> you know, that's not the way it works. You know, the marriage is not the end of the relationship. It's the beginning of the relationship. And my commitment to her was at the beginning. And now for 40, 42 years, she has been washing my clothes and feeding me and, and loving me. And thank God for her. 
Um, but you see, it starts with commitment. And you see, some people in religion get this thing back to front. They think, well, if I serve the Lord and I pursue the Lord and I love the Lord and I want to please the Lord with my life, then one day, one day at the very end, the Lord will save me. That's not the way it works. You get saved first. The relationship begins first. The commitment is first. And by the way, it's, well, the commitment is it's basically like saying, I do. And we've seen this through the scriptures in many places that um, uh, the Holy Spirit comes to us as a, as a sinner and he woos us to Christ and he puts this proposition as the servant of Abraham put it to Rebekah. And Rebekah had never seen Isaac and he said, that, will, you, will you have Isaac to be your husband? And she had never seen him. The Holy Spirit came to me on the 29th of April, 1979 and he said, will you have Jesus Christ to be your Savior? And I've never seen Jesus. And there was a certain risk Maybe there was a certain risk for Rebecca. She had never met him before. But somehow she knew it was of God. And that night I said yes to Jesus. And he came into my heart. And he saved my soul. And he changed my life from inside out. And he put a love in my heart for him. And since that time, 45 years ago, I've been uh, serving the Lord and pursuing the Lord and having a relationship with the Lord and enjoying the Lord. But it started when I got saved. Salvation happens first. You're born first, then your life happens after that. You're born again first, then your spiritual life happens after that. And so that's why Paul has this second point, pursuing Christ, after the fact that he has won Christ. He's saved in Christ. He stands, he's found in Christ, not having his own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith, the faith of God, the righteousness which is of God by faith. We're saved the moment our heart understands our need of him, and we approach him, and really we, we surrender all of our religion, our good works. We leave that all behind, and we say, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. And we trust Christ. And in that moment, friend, as the grace of God, as the gift of God, he will take his righteousness, and he will dress you. He will, give his, he will take his gift and he will give it to you. He will take the payment of your sin that he made for you 2,000 years ago, and he will put it on your record, paid in full. And in that moment, you're as saved as you will ever be. You're as good as in heaven. The Bible says you're already seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, Ephesians chapter 2. And so I want to make that so very, very clear. All through the New Testament, the book of Romans, which is a whole book about getting right with God, it spends the first 11 chapters telling you what God has done for you and describing salvation. And then when you get to chapter 12, verse 1, then it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, because of all that God has done in these first 11 chapters, because of all of the mercies now, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Why is it reasonable? Because of all that he's done. God loves you first before you'll ever love him. And so the commitment of Christ is to you, and you win Christ and come to him and receive him as your personal savior. And then you get saved and you're as, a, you're as good as in heaven. You're declared righteous in the sight of God and you belong to him in that moment that you believe. It's not a process, it's an event. It's a moment when you believe upon Christ and you're saved. But now he doesn't take you to heaven immediately. He leaves you here. He left Paul here. And now what, what do we see? We see Paul pursuing Christ. That's one now that he, that he is, is now his Savior and his God and his Lord. Well, now it begins a process of pursuing Christ. And he says in verse 10, that I may know him. Now there's several words for know in the New Testament. Uh, there is an intellectual knowledge. Some people know all there is to know about Jesus intellectually and theologically, but they don't know him. In fact, the Bible says when Jesus comes, he will execute uh, 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 vengeance on them that know not gone. Let me ask you something. Do you know gone? It's not that you know about Jesus. Do you know Jesus? I'm reminded of the story of Nathaniel. When Nathaniel came to meet Jesus, and as he was coming, Jesus says, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. And 
Nathaniel heard that and he says, how do you know me? We have never met before. How do you know who I am? And Jesus said, Nathaniel, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw thee. And Nathaniel completely changed. He says, you're the son of God. You're the king of Israel. Why the great change? Because Nathaniel knew he was by himself. And he's probably in prayer talking to God. And it's like Jesus says, Nathaniel, do you not know me? Because Nathaniel did know God. And so when the Messiah showed up, then he says, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me. That's Old Testament people who were saved, you see. And then somebody, who, when Jesus was there and they weren't saved, and then Jesus says, he that comes to me. You don't have to go through the Father now that I'm here. My Father worketh hither too, now I work. And so all the Old Testament saints that were saved before Jesus got there will come to Jesus and receive him, obviously, because he knows them. But then if somebody wants to get saved, they can just come directly to Jesus. He that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. And so it's important that we know him. We know him in salvation, but then we continue to grow to know him experientially. That's the word that is used here, not an in intellectual knowledge, but that I might know him experientially, that I might have a personal, intimate relationship with the person of the living God who is true and real. And so for 45 years, I got saved that night by simply believing upon the Lord. But ever since that time has been a process and a pursuit of knowing Christ. And this was Paul's heart's desire. When Paul realized what Jesus did for him, he put his heart and life on the line. So that now he was saying, for me to live is Christ. My whole life is Christ. And you know, he says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. He wanted to know Christ and his ability working through the apostle. And then the fellowship of a son. Now, we like the power part. We like to see God working through our lives. But what about the next bit? The fellowship of his sufferings. The word fellowship there means to have in common. You know, some people, some preachers will say, well, if you get saved, then everything's going to be rosy in your life. And you'll be healthy and wealthy and wise, and everything will go great. And that's not true, friend. The Apostle Paul said, I die daily. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And friend, sometimes for the believer, when he gets saved, and he is saved, he's on his way to heaven, but his life and his experience is one many times of great sorrow. He talks about the fellowship of his sufferings. And if any Christian suffered in the New Testament, it was the Apostle Paul. Read about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Thrice I was... Uh, stone shipwrecked, left for dead uh, of the Jews of uh, 40 times uh, I, I received uh, thrice I uh, suffered shipwreck. Uh, he says I was stoned, I was, I was beaten of the Jews many times. He suffered a lot. Why did he go through that? There's a special communion you have with the Lord and it's one thing to hear this, another thing to experience it. If you ever suffered for Jesus' sake, there's a special peace and fellowship and presence of the Lord that comes to you because you're, you're entering into something that, that Christ has experienced and now you're experiencing it too. Now, we don't really like that. But the Apostle Paul was one who not only expected it, um, but was willing to endure it. And, and, and in fact, I think, um, uh, invited it. Someone once said, you know, how was the Apostle Paul when he entered heaven's gate going to face Stephen? Now, you remember what happened with Stephen? Stephen preached the sermon in Acts chapter 7. In chapter 8, Paul, or the Apostle, or the, before he got saved, Saul was holding the clothes of them that stoned Stephen to death. Saul saw Stephen's face as, as like an angel. As Stephen lifted his eyes toward heaven, and as he forgave those who were stoning him to death, and the, the, uh, Saul, as he uh, watched that scene, um, was giving himself on, and, and his approval to what was taking place. And many other Christians he persecuted even on the death, he said. And so what's it going to be like for Paul to walk through heaven's gate and the first person he meets is Stephen? And so it could be that, that, that Paul was really wishing and hoping that he would be made conformable onto his death. That not only would he suffer for Jesus, but he would literally die for Jesus, that he would be martyred. And of course he was. And so when, when Paul walked through heaven's gate and he met Stephen, uh, 
he, met, he went the same way. He went to heaven the same way. He, he met a, a martyr's death. And so Paul was willing for that. And he was open for that in his pursuit of Christ. There was nothing held back. Even his very life for me to live as Christ, to die is gain, he said. And so he knew, he wanted to know Jesus in his power and in his sufferings and even in his death. And what he was saying was, whatever God has for me, that's what I want. Whatever his will is for me, that's what I want. And that's what he means in verse 11. If by any means I may attain unto the resurrection of the dead between now and my resurrection, I want to attain what Christ wants for me. He goes on with that thought in verse number 12. So first of all, we are to pursue Christ. It's not religion. It's not church. It's a personal relationship with the living Christ. Do I know him? Do I talk to him? Does he talk to me through the scriptures? Do I walk with him each day? Is he on my heart and mind each and every day? You know, it was one of the things that surprised me when I became a Christian that I couldn't stop thinking about it. Before I became a Christian, the eternal things in God, maybe once in a blue moon I would think about God, but after I got saved I couldn't stop thinking about it. And it, wasn't, it amazed me that people would just think of Christianity as church on Sunday. And I was a Christian on Monday and on Tuesday and Wednesday, Thursday, and I couldn't get enough of it. So much so that when I got saved, I said to the preacher, I didn't know anything about it. It was the first time I'd ever been to a church. And I said, when, when's the next time this is on? And so they told me about the midweek Bible study. They told me about the first thing actually was visitation. And they told me we met at the pastor's house on a Tuesday night. And uh, I think it was maybe a week after that that I actually got to go. And I drove up there and they were getting in the cars and they were leaving. I thought it was a meeting. I said, did I miss it? Did I get to talk? And they said, no, uh, we're, we're, we're doing visitation right now. Come with us. And so we went down on the streets of Belfast, knocking on doors and telling people about it. Was, it overtook my life. You can't meet Christ and, and remain the same. There's a pursuit. There's a knowledge of him. It's not just for Sunday. And so we are to pursue Christ. And then we are to pursue Christ's purpose in verse number 12. And this is kind of a tongue twister. Let's kind of read this. In verse 12 it says, Not as though I had already attained either were already perfect. But I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I'm apprehended of Christ Jesus. Now what's he saying here is that he says, I haven't arrived. Even here and I, in the latter part of his ministry in jail, and he'd experienced many things from the Lord, and yet he says, not as though I had already attained. Now some Christians don't act that way. Some, some Christians and some preachers I know, it seems like they feel like they've arrived. They've experienced everything there is to experience, and they're on the plateau, and uh, they've gone as far as they can with the Lord. Well, the Apostle Paul didn't think that. Do you know you haven't arrived? Did you know there's more things in your relationship with God that you haven't experienced yet? Do you know there's more things to learn about Jesus that you haven't, you haven't learned yet? That none of us have arrived. We haven't arrived yet. And so Paul is saying, I'm pursuing that purpose. Now, that's verse 12, the, the latter part. He says, I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which I'm apprehended of Christ Jesus. Well, let's reverse that. First of all, he says, Christ has apprehended me. Now, what does it mean to apprehend? When I was uh, a young fella, we were worried about the police apprehending us. And uh, the RUC, the Royal Ulster Constabulary, had, had, and I got caught one time, I told you about that story on the motorbike. Do you remember that one? I'll have to tell it again. Some of you are new. But not right now. But anyway, to be apprehended was the police would come with a long arm or the law would get you and grab you. To be apprehended means to be seized. It means to be grabbed, to be apprehended. Do you know that the Lord has grabbed us? That he has apprehended us? And if you're not saved, he's wanting to grab you. And um, if you let him, he will. But once he has grabbed us, there's a purpose for which he apprehends us. You know that God just doesn't save us to take us to heaven, or otherwise he had already done that. We'd already all be in heaven. He's left us here. Why did he leave us? Because he's a purpose. God has a purpose. God has a purpose for your life. I think of uh, uh, Brother Darren. And ever since I've known him, it was all about Peru. And how long have you been thinking about going to Peru, brother? About two years. Seven years. Okay, and I think he was just a teenager when he started talking about Peru. And so he's all about Peru. 
And you'd have to say, well, God's purpose for Darren's life has got something to do with Peru. And going to Peru and telling the Peruvian people about the Lord Jesus. And, you know, we don't know how much time we've got left, but I would imagine that God's will for Darren and his wife is to go to Peru and to go through all of those experiences of a new missionary and as a, and a, then an experienced missionary of starting churches and winning people to Christ. That's, that's God's purpose for you. God has called them to do that. And what Paul is saying here is that Christ has apprehended me. But notice the first part of that verse in verse 12. He says, I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ. In other words, he says, I want to grab hold of the purpose for which God has grabbed me. God has apprehended me for a purpose, therefore I, and because of what he's done for me, I'm motivated to love him, to serve him, and I want to grab a hold of that purpose and that reason why he saved me. He saved me for heaven, for sure, but there's also other purposes in our lives that God has for us. What is God's purpose for your life? God has a, at least something for all of us to do. You say, how would you find that out? Well, there's some things that are common for all the Christians. For example, we are to exhibit the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace. All those fruits of the Spirit are, are something that should be true in every believer. But I'll tell you something else. That um, each, each one of us has received at least one spiritual ability or a spiritual gift. And when you join our church, at least over the last couple of years, in fact, I just gave um, the discipleship, discipleship 101. It's on the website, by the way, if you ever want to look at that. And in the last part of the discipleship 101 is a spiritual gifts test, where you can just take for yourself and you find out, well, where, where, do I, where, where, do, where does God, what has God given to me as far as uh, an ability and a desire and a qualification or an opportunity? There's, there's a certain ability that God has given to every single Christian. You have at least one spiritual gift. And to be honest with you, that's, that's a really good clue as far as what God would have you to do. And, you know, for, for better, for worse, I believe, and, and every gift is, you know, some hundredfold, sixtyfold, thirtyfold, but, you know, I believe God has given me the gift of teaching and preaching. Um, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not so good, but um, if you'd have known me before I got saved, you'd have said, there's no way that guy ever stands up and talks in front of anybody. Um, but God has given me that. That's part of my purpose. And so for me, the fulfillment of my life is not only to know Christ, to, to win Christ and to know Christ, but what does Jesus want me to do with my life? Is there something God has for me to do? I mean, wouldn't it be a waste to go through your whole life and never find out what God's purpose was? Wouldn't it be a terrible thing to not even desire to know what God's purpose was for your life? not even to know what your spiritual gift is and to exercise that spiritual gift, wouldn't that be a terrible waste? And yet maybe some of you don't know what that is. And I'll tell you what, the most wonderful thing in all the world is that day when you find out this is what God has made me to do. There's a niche, there's a little groove that you find yourself in and you're going along and you are blessed and other people are blessed and there's a fulfillment in that. And you find out that God has given you the ability to do it and you want to do it and you love to do it and other people love you doing it. I mean, there's, it's fantastic. Paul says, that's what I want to do. I want to grab hold of the purpose for which he has grabbed me. To not only pursue Christ, but to su pursue God's purpose for our lives. And you know, think about it, though. Many Christians are, are not even aware of this or even concerned about it. And as far as they're concerned, well, as long as I'm saved and going to heaven, that's all I worry about. And you're missing it. And one day you're going to stand before the Lord and it's like the man with the talent and, and you're going to have to give an account with what God has given to you. And the Lord says, well, what did you do with my purpose and, and the gifting that I give to you? And, you? and he says, well, I didn't do anything with it. It's like the man that holds the, that brings the handkerchief. You remember that? And he, he, he hands the handkerchief back, unused, uninvested. It's like you didn't live. There's more to life than what you're experiencing. And the secret to it is finding out the will of God and doing it. That is the most fulfilling thing in all of life. It is the most wonderful thing. And yet so many Christians have no idea. Without purpose, without guidance, without direction, without desire. But the apostle said that I may know him. And that I might follow after, that I might apprehend. 
Now he says in verse 13, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. In other words, again, he says, I'm not completely fulfilled. And there is a time in 2 Timothy chapter 4, the last chapter that he wrote in the Bible, and he says, that I, he says, I've run my race. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. There was a time when Paul had finished what God had done, uh, got him to do. But right now, as he writes this, he, he realizes there's more for him to do. And he says, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. It's, it's, like, the, it's like a race. You know, the Bible says that Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. We begin the race by getting saved, by trusting Him as our Savior. And then He's with us each step of the way as we run the race. And yet, so He starts the race, He's also at the end. He's at the finish line. And that's what He's talking about. He's talking about the finish line. If there is a purpose for our lives, then we want to grab a hold of that. We understand what it is. But we want to keep on pressing on. You say, well, I feel. That's why He says, I forget those things which are behind. If I, one of the most discouraging things you can do as a person, as a Christian, or even if you're not a Christian, is to remember the things of the past because you can remember all the bad things that have happened, all the failures, all the things that make you groan in your spirit. Oh my goodness, what a disaster. Forget about that. Don't let that drag you back. Say, well, I can't do anything because I failed in this area. No, forget about those things which are behind and look toward the prize, look for the finish line and keep pressing on. And don't get to the place as a believer where you say, well, I've fulfilled my purpose I'm arrived. There's nothing more I can do. No, there's always more to do for the Lord. Press on. I press toward the mark for the prize. There is a prize, by the way. There is a war, reward in heaven. Now, heaven is not a reward. Heaven is a gift that God gives you in grace. But as we serve the Lord in this life, as we love Him and pursue Him and fulfill His purpose for our lives, the Bible says there are rewards for that. That's what the judgment seat of Christ is all about. Sometimes we forget that. One day we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. They give an account of the things that we have done, whether good or bad. And the things that are good that we have done for the Lord, we will be rewarded for that. And we will enjoy that through the millennial kingdom and through all eternity. But we have to press on. So we must pursue Christ. And we must pursue Christ's purpose in our lives. What is that purpose? Find out what it is. And do what he wants you to do. And then lastly, very quickly... There's many more verses here from verse 15 through verse 19. And we're going to, next time we're going to talk about verse 20, 21, just two verses. And that is the anticipation of Christ. You see, everything about our life is about Jesus. The beginning, the middle, and the end. The author and finish of our faith. It's all about Jesus for me to live as Christ, to die as again. Now, if you got a hold of that, you will understand what the purpose of life is and you will be so happy and so fulfilled in that. Not your circumstances, but you will have happiness and you will have blessing and you will have joy in your life because Christ is your life. That's what Paul's testament, that's what his story is. And so let me just finish quickly in verse 15. He says, let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded. He says, this is not just for me and my story, this is for you and your story. And the thing I want to point out here in these verses, he, he speaks about um, the fact that we're running this race, but we're not running it alone. You know, in the scriptures, we do not find that Christians are to uh, be running the race by themselves. You're, you're not a lone ranger in this. And you know that this morning because you're sitting with a bunch of other people, right? And most, if not all of us in here are saved, right? Um, and so in verse 15, he says, let us, verse 16, verse 17, he says, you have us. It's a community, so we pursue Christ's purpose together. There's a togetherness in this Christian experience. We're in the race together. We're observing this, verse 16. Nevertheless, here, uh, here too we have already attained. Let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. All of us have to follow the same rules. All of us have to mind the same principles. And of course, some are further along than others. In verse 17, brethren, be followers together of me. Paul says. You see, some people have been in the race longer than others. And it's good to be in the community. Um, now, I'm naturally I'm a loner. But see, when it comes to Christianity, I have to have church. Um, I love church. Before I got saved, I didn't like church. Never went to church. But once I got saved, everything changed. I, you couldn't keep me out of it. I love church. 
and I still love church. Now you say, well, you're, you're the preacher. <laughs> well, that's a good thing if I love church. It'd be, pre- it'd be pretty sad, wouldn't it, <laughs> if I was a preacher and then I come to church. I love coming to church. And you say, well, you get paid to do this. I did this before I got paid to do it. And I would do it if I didn't get paid to do it. I'd work a separate job if I could preach. I would preach on the, on the street corner if I didn't have a church. I love doing what I do. And, um, but I, I need the church. And let me tell you something. If you forget everything I said this morning, I wanted to leave with this one thought. I've been doing this for 45 years. And I'm only at a church if I'm, usually if I'm sick, right? If I'm in bed. Uh, otherwise, I've got to be here. And I, I want to be here. Um, so I've been doing this a long time. And I'm going to tell you something. I've, I've known a lot of people in 45 years. And I have a wee bit of experience there. And I know people, believers, who have stuck in church, who are part of the furniture, uh, like these three right here on the front row. <laughs> Brother, Brother Mike and Jennifer, Miss Barbara, part of the furniture, right? Uh, a preacher told me one time about Miss Barbara, she said, he says, she'll go down with the ship. <laughs> That's the truth. Um, and there's many, many people in here are like that. And church is such an intricate part of their lives. There's the, 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 the gatherness, the fellowship of the, of, the, of the brethren together. But I've known a lot of people just like this. And you know what happens in a person's life who are like this? They're stable, they're strong, they're content, they're satisfied, and their spiritual life is vibrant, usually. Their spiritual life um, is real, and they're pursuing Christ's purpose for their life. And there's a steadiness in their Christian testimony and walk that lasts for years and years and years. I've also known other people they come into church, and they might be in for church for a little while, and then something happens. And let me, let me warn you about something. Satan hates church, and he hates the idea of you being in church, because he knows if you stick in church, you're going to grow, you're going to be stronger, you're going to be encouraged. Not only that, but God's going to use you in church to help other people in the church and outside the church, because the church is the center of all things. The New Testament is about church. Most of the letters of the New Testament are written to churches. And so... I've known people who come into church and then something happens. And there's always something that can happen. Somebody says something, but I didn't like what the preacher said. Didn't like the audit, didn't, look, didn't like the look he gave me or whatever it is. Or maybe not even be the preacher. It could be somebody in the church. Or maybe somebody outside the church trying to pull you out of church. They don't want you in church. Don't like you going to church. Give you a hassle about church. Trying to see it and want you out of church. Now, the people I've known who were in church and got out of church, and look at their lives. And I could tell you, I could tell you, I could tell you dozens, scores, maybe hundreds of stories of people who were sitting in church just like you are this morning, but they're not here this morning. And, some, and by the way, it's not that you have to be in this church. Now, we want you to be in this church, but not necessarily. But the Christian should be in church and should stick in church because I've seen the two, the two sides of the story of those who stay in church and those who get out of church. I'm telling you, if you get out of church, you're looking at a world of trouble. And you won't be happy. The most miserable person in the world is a truly born-again Christian who's out of fellowship with God's people and not in church. Now, you might be able to scrape by, but I'm telling you, your life is not what it's supposed to be when you get out of church. Because, guess what? We're supposed to do this together. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. The New Testament is all about the church. And if you're a Christian, you say, well, I don't need the church. I'm telling you right now, you're wrong. And I know from experience, when you stay in church, you'll be strong, you'll be happy, you get out of church, it will be miserable. And it'll affect those around you, your children, your family. That's for free. But I'm telling you, that's the truth. That is the truth. The point is, we're in this together and we pursue the purposes of God together. He says, brethren, be followers together of me. And mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. The thing about it's like a family. There's old people and young people, not just age wise. Some some Christians in here, maybe you've only been saved ten years, but you're very mature. And you're a good example. And as a pastor, what I want as far as leadership in church is people who are a good example. If we want if you're gonna be teaching Sunday school or doing a wanna or some other thing or in church. We are standing up here and helping people. I want you to have a good example. I don't want you to be doing this on, on a Sunday and then you're down the pub on Thursday night or something, you know. You have to be a good example. It's important that we have 
a good example. And the thing is, in church, you have people who have been down the road a little bit, and Paul says, be followers of me. You know, yesterday morning, I opened the blinds, and the sun was just coming up, and out our bluff, it was just, you could see nothing. I almost took a photograph, because you seen the trees, and it was just mist, it was fog. And the way the light was shining through, it was, it was really kind of cool, you know. But if you ever, that's okay when you're in the house when it's foggy, but if you ever went out driving when it's foggy, and you can only see this in front of your face, and you're driving, and everybody slows right, you put your, your flashers on, you're slowing right down. And when there's nobody in front of you, it's very, you know, you can just barely see the white line and the yellow line, but, but just barely, and you're just crawling along. You know, it's really good, somebody comes in front of you, and you can see the red lights. Now, if they go off the ditch, you also have to be kind of checking yourself with the white line, right? But it's kind of reassuring when there's somebody ahead of you, and you, got, you see those little, two little red dots, you know? And you say, well, <clears throat> and at least they're ahead of me. <laughs> well, you know, some of these older believers are, are like the, the little red dots, and you can kind of follow them. Because many of those believers have been through many things, maybe that you haven't been through yet. And maybe they have experiences, and it's helpful. You need them. I need them. And you know what? They need you. Yes. You see, discipleship is not salvation. Salvation is when you come to Christ. Discipleship is following Christ. That's what we're talking about. Salvation is what we talked about last week. Following Christ is what we're talking about this week, that I may know him and to follow his purpose and to do it together, to follow Christ. And you know what? Someone once said, everybody should have a Paul. Somebody's a little further along than I am, a little older maybe, uh, older in the faith, more experienced, and I can call them and ask them questions and follow their faith and let them be an example to me and encouragement to me. I need a Paul, but I also need a Timothy. I need somebody who's following after me and that I can reach down and help, and I'm reaching up here to get help, and I'm reaching down to help him, and we help one another as we go along in the journey. Now, he talks about people who are in the race who are not really, um, they're enemies of the, of, the, of the cross of Christ. And he says, I talk about it even weeping. Let me tell you something. Not everybody in a track suit is in the same race you're in. There's people who call themselves Christians, and I'm telling you, they'll, they'll, read, they'll lead you astray. You've got to be very, very careful. So you've got to be watching the, the red dots, but if they go off the road, you stay on the road. Because we don't follow people, ultimately we're following the Lord. But the thing is, we're in this together, and the Lord says the church is there. It's an assembly of people together to help one another. What we're talking about this morning is pursuing Christ. We have one Christ, and now we love him. We're interested in him. Whatever he's interested in, I'm interested in. If he loves the church, I love the church. If he wants me to serve him, I want to serve. And so we're saved. We have one Christ. But he hasn't taken us to heaven. There's a reason we're still here. Do you know what it is? Because I'm telling you, that is the secret. His purpose in your life is the secret to your happiness and to your well-being and for your purpose to follow Christ, to pursue him. That's the goal. That's the mark. The word mark there is skupos, the thing that we're looking at, the thing that we're aiming for. There is purpose in the Christian life. There is progression in the, the Christian life. We are to constantly purpose to follow him, to apprehend that for which I have been apprehended. God grabbed me for a reason. I want to know what that reason is, and I want to fulfill that in my life because that really is the secret to your purpose and blessing and rejoicing in your life, not the circumstances, not your possessions, not your outward happiness. He's in a jail cell, and yet he said to rejoice in Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your precious words.